Hi everybody, I'm J-Man, and today we are playing Gran Turismo Sport. But before we play, I'd like to read from Judges 16 verse 28. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once. O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. All right. So that's Judges 16, verse 28, that we just read from the English Standard Version. I like to tell you that's the English Standard Version because that's important to me, and I just threw the Bible because I didn't have a good place to put it, so I tossed it off to the side. Not the best way to use that. I should respect that book. Bible is basic instructions before leaving Earth, as some people like to call it. You don't have to call it that. Um, that's what I'm going to go with. B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving Earth. But, again, I feel like, once again, I just gave you a verse out of context. And, and in all honesty, it is a verse completely out of context. Uh, I think I'll tell you about what judges are, and then I'll get into who Samson was, and then I'll explain why that's important to everything else. Now, the first thing we already know is the Philistines. We've talked about them when we talked about David and Goliath. It's the same group of people. It's not, uh, again, it's not like some sort of a, uh, how do I want, what do I think about it? Um, not some sort of insult or something like that. It's this group of people that were literally known as the Philistines. Um, okay, that out of the way, what are judges? Judges were set up by God to be people to keep Israel in line. As Israel had moved uh, from the, from Egypt to the promised land they uh, had a few issues going in there so first Moses took the Israelites out of Egypt into or just outside of the promised land and then from there Joshua took over and Joshua ruled not really ruled but led Israel into the promised land for a little while he made sure that they started to take the land but during Joshua's time as leader some people made deals with certain people in the land that kind of caused them to not be willing to relinquish the land like they were supposed to like God promised because humans made mistakes so God set up judges which is kind of how he viewed Joshua at first was a judge to go in and to ensure that the land was ready to go for the Israelites and to help clear out some of the non-Israelites Philistines, Midianites and other groups of people so that uh, it was more of the Israelites land and in doing so we have uh, judges like Gideon, Samson, Deborah, uh, one of my favorites actually, which I'm not talking about this time, uh, Ehud. I might talk about Ehud. Uh, yeah, I'll probably talk about Ehud eventually. Um, but a, a bunch of people who went to help Israel reclaim this land or claim this land for their own. So, Samson, who we're talking about today, was one of those judges and Samson Samson's an interesting one so Samson was born and when he was born uh, he was promised and it was that he was going to be something called a Nazarite basically what that means is that he was going to live a life with very long hair and he was gonna live a life where he did not indulge in certain activities such as alcohol and um, there's a few other rules I think like meats not all meats but it's even more strict of a diet than the normal Israelite diet it's a str more strict diet um, and no alcohol um, and the hair has to grow and there's a few other things about it that I honestly I don't remember everything about what it means to be a Nazarite but it's, uh, 
a group of people that actually are, when you think of Nazarene from Jesus' time, where Jesus was from, Jesus of Nazarene, would have been the kind of people who let their hair grow long and wild and crazy, which um, some of the artists depict of Jesus, but that's getting off topic right now. Um, because we also know that Jesus did drink alcohol, he turned water into wine, so eh, questionable. But the whole purpose of Samson being a Nazarene, or a Nazarite, was to um, set up a holy lifestyle for him. And by being a Nazarite, God gave Samson strength. We're talking superhuman strength. At one point in Samson's life, uh, he was walking down the road, and this lion came and didn't necessarily attack him, but definitely provoked him. And he got into a fight with this lion, and he wound up snapping, killing the lion. He fought and won against the lion in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Like a cartoon. Um, and so after this fight with this lion, he's walking by there a few days later, and he's hungry. And he has to be careful about what he eats. Like, he can't eat the carcass of the lion. But he can eat the honey. Apparently some bees have used the lion's body and turned it into a hive. And they made honey. And so he took the honey from the lion and he ate the honey. And while he was going this way, he met this beautiful woman and he wanted to marry this woman. But she wasn't a Nazarite and she wasn't an Israelite. So in order to be able to marry this woman, he came up with a trap. He said that if anybody from this town could solve his riddle, they would, uh, he would not marry this woman. But if they couldn't solve his riddle, he would marry this woman. And she was a beautiful woman to him, so he decided that it was worth it. And he riddled them this. Now, you know the answer, because I just told you. But he said, from the strong comes something sweet. And that was his riddle. Now, maybe the people of this time understood that uh, the carcasses of lions, bees could use them for a hive. But I don't think anybody knew that that's what he was talking about. And obviously they didn't, because... As it turns out, nobody could solve his riddle. So he married the woman, and after they got married, the woman said, okay, everybody wants to know, what are you even talking about? How do you solve this riddle? And he explains about the lion and the bees and the honey that he ate. And the woman that he married goes and tells the rest of the town. She says, so here's what happened. And they get angry, and they want to harm Samson. Now, they don't know that Samson has some Superman-like strength or beyond some cartoonish strength. So, they plan this attack. Hey, we won. They plan this attack. And in this attack, uh, what happens is Samson actually, during this attack, Samson collects some foxes, ties their tails together, lights their tails on fire, and they go off scurrying and... Um, burn down the whole town because of the fight. Another point in Samson's life, he got into a fight with 12 men with weapons, and he didn't have a weapon on him, so instead of having a weapon on him, he decided that uh, he was going to look for a weapon around him. He found a jawbone of a donkey, and he used this jawbone to uh, defeat a dozen of his enemies with a donkey's jawbone. Well, the incident with his first wife didn't go so well. Uh, everybody that survived it, or when she survived it, she divorced him. It was over. Their marriage was done. Now, this wasn't Delilah. Now, most people who know Samson, or think they know the name Samson, typically know the name Delilah. Yes, this is that Samson connected to that Delilah. So... A different group. I think the Midianites were the woman, were the uh, of the first woman that he married. 
Then a Philistine woman named Delilah, who Samson also found to be a beauty, uh, attracted Samson's attention. And this time they don't get married. Instead, they spend an awful lot of time together. And this time, Delilah discovers that, hey, Samson is strong. Where does his strength come from? So, some of the Philistines are like, hey, you've got the inside knowledge. You can find out where he gets his strength from. And so she says, Samson, where does your strength come from? And he says, well, uh, if, I'll tell you how you can defeat me. If you tie me up with uh, certain fresh threads, then I won't be able to surpass it. And uh, I will be captured. And she makes him fall asleep, ties him with the fresh uh, leather, fresh ropes, and she says, Samson, the, Phil Samson, the Philistines are on you. And he escapes from it really quickly and defeats the Philistines, the ones that were on him. And then they came to her and they said, you lied to us. And she said, he lied to me. So then she goes to him again. She says, no, seriously, you lied to me. And he says, okay, okay, here's what you do. You have to bind up my hair in a funky way with a loom. You have to bind my hair into the loom, and uh, that will defeat me. So she goes to the Philistines a second time. Now, why why he trusted her to, you know, why he trusted her at this point, why she trusted him at this point, why the Philistines trusted her, why anybody trusted anybody beyond me. But they tie him up in a loom, and Samson, the Philistines are on you. And again, he breaks out, no problem, and defeats the Philistines. So now she's embarrassed. She says, you're embarrassing me and you're lying to me. Why are you embarrassing me and lying to me? Now, again, why he stays with her at this point, I don't know. But this time he says, if you hog tie me, and you have to hog tie me like seven different ways and just get me all nice and hog tied, nice and tight. And she does this, tells the Philistines, I got it figured out, and they show up. And Samson, the Philistines are on you. And again, he breaks out of that. And the Philistines come and he defeats those Philistines. And this time she's mad and she's sad and she's crying. And he still finds her to be beautiful and attractive. And for some reason, he trusts her. So he says, okay, here's the truth. If you shave my head, I will lose my strength. So she has him fall asleep. Maybe he's thinking that they're not going to trust her this time. Maybe he's thinking that she's not going to trust me this time. She has him fall asleep. She shaves off his head. She lets them in. Samson, the Philistines are on you. And he goes to fight back. And he has no strength. The spirit of the Lord has left him because his hair was gone. At this point, they gouge out his eyes. They arrest him. They take him to the Philistines' capital. And... He's there for a little while, and while he's there, they set up this giant celebration because he's been captured. 30,000 of the Philistines are there at this time. And while they're there, they want to see the strong man. They want to see the Samson. So they bring Samson out to show him off, to laugh at him, to mock him. And during this time, Samson tells the young man that they brought with him to guide him to be his seeing eye dog can you rest these weary bones of mine just put one hand on each of these pillars that are right next to me that I know are here and the young man does it without considering it and while he's like that oh yikes and while he's um in that position with his hands pressed up against the uh, pillars that's when he prays and says Lord avenge me let me get the Philistines for what they've done to my eyes and he crushes presses on the pillars and crushes the Philistines and everybody there dies including Samson but I think this no nah. I say I think this is a good representation of 
sacrifice. And it's exactly what Jesus does on the cross. He sacrifices of himself. He says that he takes who he is and he lays himself out to die so that it can be better for everybody else. It's not just about dying. It's about dying to save others. Hey, another win. And that's what Samson did. That's the purpose of the story of Samson was to die so that others could have a better life, could be better. Samson was to help the Israelites escape from these rulers, uh, these crazy rulers that were, of course, the Philistines. Now, <sighs> Samson still didn't do it in the right way. And, like I questioned, why would he even have trusted this woman who he knew didn't truly appreciate him for who he was? The, the story of Samson and Delilah, as I see it, is an interesting story of love, but I don't ever see Delilah as actually having loved Samson. I think she loved Samson before the uh, Philistines came to her and pretty much offered her money, power, wealth, whatever she wanted, a better life. And that's when she decided that whatever she felt or thought she felt for Samson didn't matter. What was more important was her greed, whatever they were offering her, the money, it, anything but who Samson was. Now, again, what does this have to do with scriptures and everything I'm talking about? Well, there's an interesting situation here where in Samson's story, it talks about the spirit leaving Samson after his hair is shaved. Now, to me, being a Christian, not a Jew, I see it as God in three parts. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Ghost, whom Jesus sent after on Pentecost, uh, which we find in Acts, um, to be with and on all of God's people. And in this case, we see the Spirit on Samson before Jesus even came to earth. Now that's interesting to me because I will say there's one God, three parts. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the question of, well, do we see the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament before this? We do. We see the, the Holy Spirit in Genesis 1. When God is talking God is talking in a plural sense, a we sense, possibly talking to Jesus as well, even though Jesus hasn't been born yet, most likely talking to the Spirit, the Spirit of God. Now, that doesn't mean that the idea of who Jesus is, as far as God's Son and being part of God, doesn't mean that Jesus didn't exist as part of God already. He just hadn't been born in an earthly form and lived out his 33 years before being raised again. But if God is talking to the Holy Spirit, which it appears he taps into when he creates man, forms a man out of dust and clay and dirt, and then breathes the breath of his spirit, or the soul of man into man, suggesting that God's spirit is already in every man. It's not necessarily the spirit of God that, um, it's not necessarily the spirit of God. Whoa, whoa, you can't pit maneuver me like that, man. Uh, the Spirit of God that one day falls upon everybody 
in Acts, that spirit has been there because when we've looked at David and Goliath, the spirit of God was on David. When we look at Jonah, which we looked at, the spirit of God came to Jonah. So it's not just something that showed up randomly after Jesus came back from the dead. Again, what in the world? Uh, after Jesus came back from the dead, it's something that was already there, already a part of who God is from the very beginning. And we see evidence of the Spirit of God in the cre as early as the creation story. So, this Holy Spirit, or Spirit of God, being able to fall down onto Samson, it's not ridiculous. And it does help to encourage the idea that there's a multi multiple partness of God. Or that there's not just, it's not, it is one God, but in multiple capacities. God the Father works one way, God the Spirit works a different way. God the Son, Jesus, works in a third way. And they work together at the same time. So, Jesus, his goal was grace and salvation. Man can't save man on man's own. Grace and salvation need to be present. So, a part of God that focuses heavily on grace and salvation is the only way to save humanity. Enter Jesus. Jesus comes, shows who God is by living on earth, by being God, and in being God, shows exactly what true grace and forgiveness looks like to the point of dying on the cross. The interceder, the spirit. Now look, just because Samson had to live a life that was more pure doesn't mean he still lived it right. And for the most part, all he needed was his hair. His hair was what allowed the spirit to be a part of Samson so that it could intercede on Samson's behalf when Samson made some mistakes, like marrying a Midianite woman, like being involved with a Philistine woman. These are not Israelite women. These are not the women that he's supposed to be involved with. And even the way that he got him, he tricked the Midianites to allow him to marry that woman which I don't remember her name or even remember if her name is in scripture but the way he did that was it was dirty he did the Midianites very dirty in that and he needed somebody to intercede for him so that when God who judges looked at Samson and said you were impure, the spirit can say, sure, but because I am here, you were here with him, so his imperfections don't have to be the most important thing. And then for Jesus, what Jesus was able to explain was, it's not, the, the imperfections are there, and people are gonna make mistakes. But what's more important than the imperfections? Ooh, Mustang. Um, Ford Mustang GT Premium Fastback 2015. Probably have one of these cars. Mustang is great. But Jesus provided the grace so that when humans are judged by God, if they've accepted the grace of Jesus provided by the blood of Jesus, interceded through the spirit for when we make mistakes like I know I make mistakes God won't judge harshly and I won't have to go to hell anyway on that note uh, no seriously thank you for watching I hope you don't have to go to hell that you can accept Jesus Christ understanding that he died so that you don't have to I'm going to ask that God bless you again, if I haven't already, and remind you, Jesus died for you.
because God loves you.